The subject of sin is no longer a popular theme in the church today. We have suffered the Osteenization of the church in our day and time. And I know I just made up a word, but it's a word that we should use because it encapsulates the lack of appetite for the whole counsel of God. Anything that is perceived as negative today is avoided by many preachers. And yet, the Bible's teaching about sin is critical to its entire message. We can't understand the good news until we first know the bad news. We must begin with the nature and reality of sin if we are ever going to grasp the message of God's word. The apostles did not hesitate at all to address this critical issue. And John makes it absolutely clear that those who continually practice sin are children of Satan rather than children of God. Now, this book is difficult to outline because of the way John writes, but I believe that chapter 3, verses 4 through 10, forms a single unit of thought or paragraph, if you will. So we're going to take this section as our focus beginning this morning. What we find in this section really sets the tone for everything that will come later in this book. And we read this just a few minutes ago, but we need to walk through it and we need to see what John has to say about the difference between the children of God and the children of the devil. In fact, the last verse of this section, verse 10, really summarizes what this section is all about. It says, by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Here's how you can tell the difference, John says, between the two. And as we have seen, this is really what John does all the way through this book. He makes distinctions. He paints everything black and white. He gives us ways of being able to know if we are truly born again or if we are false professors of faith. And once again, John makes the distinction clear. He tells us, what children of God look like and what children of Satan look like. And this is revealed by an ongoing practice of life. It's revealed in the overall direction of one's life. So we generally need to look at a person's life and see if they're practicing righteousness or practicing sin. And of course, People don't like to put things in those kind of categories anymore, but this is what the Word of God declares. In fact, there's really nothing vague or obscure here at all. This distinction is crystal clear. The practice of a person's life is in one direction or the other. There's no middle ground. It's one or the other, and that gives indication as to whether they are a child of God or a child of the devil. And yet, as clear as this distinction is, the church in America seems to be anything but clear on this. The Joel Osteens of the world have taken away this clear understanding, and most of the evangelical world today wants to think that all you have to do is make a profession of faith and you're good to go. The vast majority of so-called Christians want to think that it doesn't really matter how you live your life. As long as you have walked down an aisle or prayed a prayer or responded to some kind of altar call in some way, you're a Christian. My friend, that is not the teaching of Scripture. We must not take it this way. There must be a change in a person's life. There must be fruit of righteousness. 
And really, if you look at church history, you see previous generations understood this. The reformers clearly understood this. The Puritans understood it. In fact, it is only in recent times that we have gotten confused about it. But today, it almost seems as if our whole concept of sin and righteousness has become tainted. Our world today really has absolutely no concept of sin whatsoever. And even in the church, there is much confusion about it. John MacArthur uses an illustration. He points to the tragic disaster that took place in 1986 at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Russia about 65 miles north of Kiev. And because of what happened there, that entire region of the world has been poisoned. And many have suffered greatly as a result of that disaster. Atomic radiation is still in the water and in the soil all these years later. And that can serve as kind of a picture of the contamination of modern evangelicalism in regard to faulty thinking about sin. There seems to be some toxic radiation that has spilled into the soil of the evangelical water table of our day. It has affected our entire understanding, the gospel. And many people today really do not understand the relationship there is between a true Christian and sin. Too many so-called Christians have decided that you can be a Christian and not worry about whether you are living in sin and compromise. In 1988, John MacArthur wrote a book that was originally called Faith Works. The title was changed to The Gospel According to the Apostles. But in that book, he gave a list of things that people have said in recent times that are completely erroneous. And I'm not going to give you the entire list this morning, but there are several of those that relate to this whole issue of the relationship between a genuine believer and sin. The first one that is touted is that Repentance is not really turning from sin, that repentance is really a synonym for faith. In other words, turning away from sin is not necessary in salvation. You can get saved without genuine repentance. So I guess when Jesus said in Mark 1.15, repent and believe the gospel, he was really saying the same thing in two different ways. He was really saying, have faith and believe the gospel. Repentance, turning away from sin, is not needed. Now remember, these are things that people have said that are totally erroneous. We know that repentance is an essential part of the biblical gospel. But you see, these kinds of ideas have become part of that toxic radiation that has polluted the groundwater of evangelicalism in recent days. What has been the result of this? Well, in many cases, it has led to the presentation of the gospel without any reference to repentance at all. I mean, how many gospel tracts have you seen that say absolutely nothing about repentance as a part of saving faith. Now, another source of this pollution has been the idea that saving faith is simply that of becoming convinced of the truth of the message of the gospel. As long as you understand the gospel and embrace that, that's what counts. It has nothing to do with submission to the lordship of Christ. It's just the understanding of the gospel, that's what counts. And we know that that is not according to the scripture because the Bible tells us that not only must we receive Jesus as Savior, we must also receive him as Lord. 
Here's another one. It is possible, they say, for Christians to lapse into long periods of spiritual barrenness. And the idea of being a carnal Christian really is tied to this view. The belief is that a Christian can fall into a state of lifelong carnality and still be saved. Another way to say this is that disobedience and prolonged sin are no reason to doubt one's salvation. In fact, contrary to what we have already seen in 1 John, some have said that it is possible to completely forsake Christ and come to a point of no longer believing and still be a Christian. Now, what's that idea based on? Well, it's based on the mistaken notion that if you believed in the past, way back there somewhere, it doesn't really matter what you are today. And what is that really, in essence? That is a rejection of the biblical doctrine of spiritual regeneration and the perseverance of the saints. Some have said that spiritual fruit is not guaranteed in the life of a true believer. In other words, some Christians spend their life in a barren wasteland of defeat, confusion, and doubt. And it's okay if they never produce any kind of spiritual fruit. The ultimate toxin is the conclusion that all who claim Christ by faith as Savior even those who are involved in serious or prolonged sin should be assured that they belong to Christ no matter what. Now, if you're really sharp and well-read this morning, you may recognize that all of those statements come from what has become known as the Dallas Doctrine, which really comprised the other side of the lordship debate but the question I have is this, have none of those who espouse such things ever read the epistle of 1 John? I mean, how can a serious student of scripture conclude that salvation does not include repentance, obedience to Christ, or spiritual fruits? And of course, both sides of the debate understand that works do not produce eternal life, but the no lordship group does not even allow for works as evidence of genuine salvation. Now, my purpose here this morning is not to go back and revisit that debate, but it is important for our present passage of Scripture. This kind of toxic radiation has polluted people's understanding of how we approach this text. MacArthur writes, easy believism, cheap grace, believing in Jesus in a moment in time which has virtually no effect on the rest of your life is still a standard approach to evangelism in the church today. He says we're still asking people to raise their hands or walk an aisle, sign a card, pray a prayer, and then affirming them that they're Christians no matter what, no matter what their life looks like. Now, we may think this is only a problem today, but this was also a problem in the day in which John wrote this book. Satan hates the true biblical gospel. And so from the very first day of the church, he made sure there were false teachers and false prophets distorting it. And we know that there were false prophets who were infiltrating the church from the very earliest of times. We've already talked about this in regard to the background for this book. We know that John was battling what would later become known as Gnosticism. Gnosticism included several elements, one of which was that it doesn't really matter what you do in the body, all that counts is what happens in your spirits. 
The body was seen as evil anyway, so you could just do whatever you wanted physically and it didn't make any difference to you spiritually, according to the Gnostics. And don't think for a moment that that has gone away. It is still very much a part of the erroneous thinking of our day and time. Another part of Gnosticism was the belief that those who achieved a certain level of knowledge were the ones who were saved. They believed that the attaining of a certain knowledge was sufficient in and of itself to accomplish salvation. This was completely divorced from anything earthly, anything physical, any, anything behavioral. As long as you had this elevated knowledge, it didn't matter what your lifestyle was. In fact, as long as you attained this secret, esoteric knowledge, it wasn't important what the particulars of your theology were. You could have a wrong view of God, a wrong view of Jesus Christ, a wrong view of the Holy Spirit, and you would still be okay because you have this special knowledge. And by the way, there's a lot of this kind of thinking in the Word of Faith movement today, and there's a lot of this kind of thinking in the Dallas Doctrine as well. But as we have already seen, John gives us a series of tasks to determine if we're truly born again and many of those have to do with having right doctrine. You have to believe certain things to be a Christian. You have to have a right view of God the Father. You have to have a right view of Jesus Christ. You have to have a correct view of the Holy Spirit. You have to have a right understanding of sin. You have to have a right view of obedience to Christ. We've seen these doctrinal tests. In fact, you could say that John's message is wrong doctrine equals damnation. John is very concerned about doctrinal tests. But he was also just as concerned about behavioral tests. The false teachers had their theology wrong, but they also failed the test of conduct. In chapter 1, we learned that they were denying sin. They were denying the necessity of holy living. And so John had to confront them and make it clear that genuine believers always give evidence of obedience, penitence, and righteousness. In chapter 2, verse 4, John said, The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. And yet, amazingly, there are still people today, even brilliant scholars, who say you can be a Christian and then live like you want to. There are, of course, the free grace people who imply that you can do whatever you want and God's grace will just cover it. But John says here in chapter 3, the children of God and the children of the devil are what? Obvious. They're obvious. How's it obvious? Well, it's obvious by how they live. You can look at their life and you can see the children of God practice righteousness which is the focus of this section, and they also love, they practice love, which is going to be the focus of the next section. Now, these are not new themes in John, but the approach here is a little different than it was before. In chapters 1 and 2, the emphasis is on fellowship. In chapters 3 through 5, the emphasis is on sonship. So we're, we're going to look back over these themes again, but from a slightly different perspective. And our current text deals with the subject of sin. There are two key statements in this section. In verse 6, it says, no one who abides in him sins. And in verse 9, it says, no one who is born of God practices sin. Now, some have mistakenly taken this to refer to some sort of perfectionism. 
And, and many are quick to say that this is inconsistent with what he said in chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, we're going to see why this is not an inconsistency as we go along. But this is not teaching perfectionism. We must not see it that way. John has already established the fact that he does not believe in perfectionism in this life. And you may remember what he said in chapter 1, verse 10. He said, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Why would John then turn right around and say that we can attain perfection in this life? That doesn't make any sense. Of course, those who hold to the doctrine of perfectionism are usually those who are Arminian in their theology. They also believe you can lose your salvation. And they teach that you can get saved and then sin a little and then you lose your salvation. And then you pray and you get it back and then you sin again and you lose it again. And, and then you pray and you get it back and you start to make a little progress toward holiness and you get to the point where you don't lose it as often and then you eventually get to the place where you no longer sin and you no longer lose it. And this is what they call attaining being being perfected, being perfected. What's the problem with that? Well, there are many problems with that. But one of the main ones is that if they are honest, they know they continue to sin, even after they're so-called perfected. Another big problem with that is that this assumes that you keep yourself saved. It fails to recognize that God is the one who keeps us saved. The Bible is clear that God is the one who saves us in the first place and that he is the one who holds us fast. Now, some also go the opposite direction. There are the antinomians who say that it really doesn't matter if we sin because after all, we're under grace. So let sin abound, that grace will also abound. What's the problem with that? The problem is, Paul said, may that never be. May it never be. Listen, we can't just act like sin is no big deal. We can't take that approach. That is not a biblical approach. And the truth of the matter is, neither of those two perspectives are biblical Christians do sin, and sin does matter. So we must reject both of those views. So how can we bring the two statements of John together? How can we understand that no one who abides in Christ sins, and at the same time, we can't say we have no sin or we're a liar? How can we bring those two together? Well, it's interesting how different theologians have tried to deal with this discrepancy or so-called apparent discrepancy. The Roman Catholic Church, for example, says that, well, John is just speaking of mortal sins here. Uh, they say that if you commit a mortal sin, the most serious kind of sin, you're not really a Christian, but it's okay to commit venial sins. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem is the Bible makes no such distinctions. I mean, do you see any mention of mortal sins and venial sins in this passage of Scripture? Of course not. That's simply Catholic dogma. Some have said, well, once you become a Christian, God no longer considers sin as sin anymore. Now, that's an interesting twist, but it goes against the teaching of Scripture. This is the very thing that John is attacking in this book. He's saying that you can't treat sin with indifference, even if you're a Christian. You, you can't just deny its existence. You can't sweep it under the rug. 
You can't ignore it. You must deal with it. Sin is real, even in the life of a believer. Well, a third way of dealing with this apparent discrepancy is the way of the hyper-dispensationalists. They say that this only applies to your new nature. Your new nature can't sin. And so they blame sin on the flesh. They say that it's your flesh that sins, but your true person, your new nature is sinless. Trying to get around it that way. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem is you just can't divide people up this way. The Bible doesn't do that. We are whole people, and when we sin, we sin as a whole person. Nowhere does the Bible divide people into parts and say that one part does not affect the other parts. Fourthly, there are those who claim that what John is doing here is John's really just expressing an ideal. You know, he's, he's describing the ultimate goal, but he doesn't intend for us to take this literally. What's the problem with that view? The problem with that view is that John is not an idealist. He is a realist. He paints everything black and white. So taking this as idealism does not fit with John's down-to-earth, matter-of-fact nature in which he writes. Well, there are others who say, well, I know what this is. You know, this is, this is describing those who are willful, defiant sinners. But those sins that we just fall into, they're exempted from this. In fact, some have even taken the position that when sin happens to us, we are victims of it. We're the victims. Now, what's the problem with that view? Well, the problem is all sin is the result of our willful disobedience. Christians can only sin when their will is activated. So in a biblical sense, all sin is willful. In fact, James wrote that we sin when lust is conceived in our hearts and we act on that. That's why we sin. You say, okay, preacher, then what's the real answer here? What's the solution? The answer is to be found in the text itself. If we analyze this text, we see that the tenses of the verbs inform us as to what John means. All the verbs in this passage are present tense verbs. They all refer to continuous, ongoing, habitual action. So what does this mean? It means that a genuine believer cannot habitually, continuously, and persistently live in sin. Yes, he will sin, but he cannot live a life of unabated sin. Why? Well, John says because he's been born of God. He's been born of God. God's seed is in him. He has a brand new nature. In fact, if you look at those two key phrases in this text, you see that the phrase in verse 6 is really defined by verse 9. In verse 6, when he says, no one who abides in him sins, it's defined in verse 9 when he says, no one who is born of God practices sin. And the New American Standard has it correct here. John is referring to the ongoing, unabated practice of sin. Believers and unbelievers are separated in this way. Unsaved people live in habitual sin. As John MacArthur says, they sin in their thoughts, in their words, and their actions in an unbroken and habitual pattern. 
Now, someone might want to argue this premise, but think about this. Even if we do not consider any other sin, unbelievers have an unbroken pattern of the sin of unbelief in their hearts. Their sin of unbelief is a way of life for them. But the point that John is making here is that unbelievers are distinct from true believers by this unbroken pattern of sin in their lives. Unbelievers live in sin and they can't help it. They can't help it. They still have the old sin nature. Therefore, they are enslaved to sin. On the other hand, genuine believers have been set free from sin and have a brand new nature. And although they are not yet free from the presence of sin, which won't happen until glorification, believers have already been set free from the bondage of sin. Now, another way to say this is to say that although Christians do sin, they don't have to. They don't have to. And genuine believers will not live in an unbroken pattern of sin. They will not continue to practice sin in an ongoing unabated way. This is what John is dealing with here. Now, I had good intentions this morning of not giving a long, protracted introduction, but I was not successful in that. This background is just too important because there's so much confusion on this. But I want to at least move into the text a little bit, and I've got just a few minutes But let's at least go to the first point before we conclude this morning. I have broken this down into four main thoughts. We're going to see the reality of sin, the removal of sin, the revelation of sin, and a recap. A recap. But let's at least get to the first one, which is the reality of sin. Look with me at verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Again, notice the concept here of practicing sin, the idea of ongoing, continual sin. But John identifies sin here as lawlessness. Literally, in the Greek, this reads, everyone doing sin is doing lawlessness. And as if that is not plain enough, John then says, sin is lawlessness. But notice he's not saying here that sin is a violation of the law. No, he's talking here about an attitude. This is the inability to be righteous. He's saying that everyone who habitually practices sin is constantly engaged in lawlessness. This is an ongoing attitude. It's not just a single violation of God's law. This is the heart of rebellion against God and his law. In fact, this is really indifference to the law of God. This is how an unbeliever is described. And the best way to say it is that an unbeliever lives as if there was no law and no lawgiver. That's how he lives his life. And one of the most frightening passages in all the word of God is found in Matthew 7, where Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And you know that passage. And you know that many come to him and they say things like, well, but we prophesied in your name and we cast out demons in your name and we did all these miracles. And Jesus will say to them what? I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice, what? Lawlessness. You who practice continually lawlessness. There is no doubt this is where John got this concept. Jesus said, these people do not belong to me because they are practicing ongoing, unabated lawlessness. And it does not matter what kind of religious acts they have done. What matters is where they are right now in regard to sin. 
And Jesus said, I don't know you. In other words, you are not in a personal relationship with me. You are still in your sin. You are still in that perpetual state of lawlessness. Now, the term lawlessness describes the constant living in rebellion against God that characterizes all unbelievers. There's an unbroken disregard for the law of God. And notice in this passage, you just go down, you see all the all-inclusive language that we find in this passage. Verse 4 says, everyone. Verse 6 says, no one, twice. Verse 9, no one. Verse 10, anyone. In other words, there are no exceptions here. Six times in this text, he uses the Greek word pasha, everybody. There are no exceptions. Everybody who practices sin is engaged in lawlessness. And the ongoing practice of lawlessness means you're outside the kingdom of God. It means you're not a believer. You're not a Christian. Jesus will say to those who come to him who are not genuine believers, depart from me, you who are practicing lawlessness, because I never knew you. I never knew you. The unsaved person lives in the constant state of lawlessness. He lives in an ongoing, unabated state of rebellion against the law of God. John MacArthur says this. He says, don't ever underestimate sin and don't ever define sin in only bits and pieces. In other words, what he's saying is that sin is not just that of single acts of defiance. It is a heart of rebellion. It is a heart of rebellion. Of course, we know there are individual acts of sin, but these are really reflections of a deeper, much more profound, consuming, captivating, dominating presence of lawlessness, John says. This is what defines the unredeemed heart. Lawlessness is open and active rebellion against God. It is an unabated protest against his will, against his word. The practice of sin can ultimately be defined this way. John clearly defines it. Now, we're almost out of time for this morning, but notice all the times that you see the word practice in this passage. You see it in verse 4. You see it again in verse 7, again in verse 8, verse 9, and again in verse 10. Over and over again, we see the word practice. An unsaved person continually practices sin. But if you are a Christian, this is no longer true of you. You no longer live as if there was no God and that he had no law. That's not how you live anymore. As a Christian, you now submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. You have repented of sin. You have put your full faith and trust in Christ. You now have a heart like David who said, oh, how I love your law. When someone comes to know Christ, the word of God becomes precious to them. The law of God becomes sweet, sweeter than honey from the honeycomb, more precious than gold. Even fine gold, as Psalm 19 says. So what am I saying? I'm saying the state of lawlessness is what we used to be, but it's not what we are now as believers. We now love the law of God. We now desire to honor Christ. We desire to do the things that are good and right in God's sight. And when we do sin, it is never an unbroken pattern of sin. There is a fundamental difference between the children of God and the children of the devil, and this is how we can tell. 
This is how we know, by the direction of someone's life. Now, we're going to see a lot more about this next time, but we need to be honest about where we stand. Anyone who lives in an unbroken, constant pattern of sin is not, according to the Bible, the Word of God, a child of God. Anyone who lives in a perpetual state of lawlessness is not born again. And we need to look at our lives and we need to see, is there a pattern of righteous, righteousness? Is there a pattern of, of desiring to please God? Is there a pattern of unchecked sin? We need to look at where we stand. Where are you this morning? Which category do you fit in? There's only two, children of God, children of the devil. Where do we fit? Let's pray together. Father, we pray this morning that we'll be honest with ourselves. We'll look at what God's word says, what it clearly instructs here. And Lord, that uh, we'll, we'll know that uh, it's important we understand about sin. It's important even as believers, we recognize what your word has to say about it. And that we know that there are two categories that John is describing. We fit in one category of the, or the other. Lord, to help us be honest with ourselves and honest with you and to assess. And I pray this morning, if there's anyone here today that, that looks at his or her life and, and has to conclude, I don't see a pattern of righteousness. I don't, I don't see uh, the fruits of, of salvation, my life, transformation, spiritual regeneration. I just see a pattern of unbroken sin and unbelief that they would recognize that. They would come to uh, that place of repentance and that place of brokenness and would uh, cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ to, to save them and change them. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would work in our hearts and lives, help us to understand uh, what you are declaring from your word today and respond to it as you would have us to. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're going to have some elders here near the front when we conclude our service in just a moment. They're here to help you, of course. And uh, we don't do the, uh, you know, the, the heavy emotional altar call kind of thing here. Uh, but we do allow you the opportunity to respond to God's word. And that is after the service, you can come and talk to one of these elders and they are here to help you. If you need to receive Christ today, you need to uh, be a part of this church family or some other thing today, um, public response, you come and, and talk to them and they will help you with that. Well, we will be back uh, tonight in our evening service. And um, sometimes people ask, well, is it, is it the same? Is it different? You know, it's different, okay? We, we do something different on Sunday night. We go through a different book of the Bible. So we're going through 1 Corinthians. We're in 1 Corinthians 15 on Sunday night. So invite you to come back and be with us at six o'clock for that uh, time in God's word. Well, good to see all of you here this morning, especially our guests with us. Hope